So what's the dupe? Um, I use the same classification again, so you can structure it a little bit with me, um, what we are looking at here. And it's, it's a stack of different components, and I'm only showing a little small fraction here of the components. So it's an open source framework um, with a file system at its core. And this is the key concept here. HDFS at the storage layer is a file system. And this file system now provides the flexibility to work with a lot of different data formats and to take in basically data in every format comes in. And connected with that file system is MapReduce, it's a programming framework um, that enables us to um, employ or use algorithms that now work with this data in parallel because we have this massive amount of data, the scale um, requirement we have. So these algorithms are now able to um, work with the data in, in parallel, map um, tasks to a lot of nodes and reduce it in the end again to provide a result. And these um, algorithms are usually also used to structure the data. So we have this poorly structured data coming in, we employ algorithms and in the end we make something useful. So this is basically the refinery. This is the step we take to refine the data. And as you can see, or maybe here now, is that it's very programming oriented. So it's not a set of standard software. It's basically, I call it maybe support tools for programmers. And that's the state we're in right now. We have a script language called PIC that's widely employed. We have an exif method called HIF that provides an, an SQL or close to SQL interface to it. And this is quite um, beneficial because if you have a, an application like a BI tool that produces SQL to access data, um, you find now a way with a little modification to make it accessing the two frameworks as well. But there's more going on. Um, there's a very big field of NoSQL databases, No standing for not only, and um, this is the group name for non-relational technology. Because we can see in the big data environment, as I stated, um, we still have the need to handle structured data, but we'll probably do that in the traditional forms we did. But for the poorly structured data, it's usually non-relational what we have to look at. And there are more than 100 databases now in the market. Lots of them, small initiatives, open source things, not really mature, not really sustainable. But some of them are quite interesting and being used more and more by companies uh, for specific topics. And this is, I think, the, the key feature here you can make it use for specific topics. And it's um, a lot of, it's in there for key value stores. These are stores that are basically very suitable for tasks like indexing, for tasks like searching, for again having data in different lengths of data sets to be able to simply work with that. We have graph databases in there um, that are used for network analysis. So if you want to understand, for example, on, on Facebook or other social networks, what people are connected with whom, it's very easy to actually show that as a graph, so to work with vectors. And um, to show that in a relational database is, is really difficult. Um, so these special types of databases, like graph databases, are useful. And document bases, as the name says, and so on. So we see a lot going on here. People or companies experimenting with new types of databases to uh, solve specific problems in the polystructured world. What also plays an important role, we see an even, even uh, increasing important role, will be the data integration tools, the data management tools, because they now form the glue often to be able to manage data, because they increasingly add to Hadoop and other NoSQL um, data stores as sources and targets. So they start to be the glue that actually is, is, um, makes it possible to work with the data, to access data from these stores and, and uh, put it in there. And this basically is only a small fraction, but then from our point of view, these are the most important technologies that, that make up um, big data data management. We also have the other side of things, that's big data analytics. So coming from the application side, we have BI tools, analytical applications, and we see rising uh, importance of R as a data and data mining framework. This is employed also more and more frequently. We have some issues around that. I already talked about them. It's about manageability, productivity, connectivity. It's basically inherent batch processing often what's happening, especially in Hadoop. And it's the lack of know-how we see in the market. 
but recently read an article that Hindu programmers on the west coast of the US are paid now about $200,000 because they are so rare. There's so much demand for this type of knowledge, and so many, so few people that actually know how to run Hindu that it's quite interesting what's happening here. And if you're more interested in big data, um, you are to be very, very interested in your feedback. You got a, a little questionnaire, you'd like to take part in this survey, and we'll give you something for that. The results, um, we sent you the presentation slide I just showed, and uh, we also have a research note on big data available in our booth, so we would like to, um, to ask you to participate, and, and thank you for that. So the third of this, coming to the, the conclusion here, what um, I showed to you. First of all, we have, I think, an increasingly heterogeneous world. Coming from the um, widening of data we want to look at, we also come to a widening of technology we have to employ. And what's now interesting is where do we find the bridges? Because what we don't really want in a company is a totally separate world of structured and unstructured and a fully structured world. We see that right now at three different levels. We see that the tools and analytic applications are increasingly able to access both traditional SQL MDX sources, but also the Hadoop and other NoSQL sources. Oops, um, we see that the analytics uh, often employed in programs like R um, are used in both worlds. And we see that the data integration tools, as mentioned, play an important role to hold everything together and together and actually be able to manage the data and the data flows that are now going and coming from an increased number of data sources. If we look at an architectural point of view, um, this is the picture I've really shown to you. I think we see a widening in architecture also. In the, on the top level, we see a widening new applications that will be needed and will be requested by business. And on the lower part of the picture, we see a widening in data sources we want to look at. And we see right now that it's, it's, these data is moving into file systems or NoSQL databases. And now the big question is how to actually bring it together. All right, talk about data integration. We already talked about the uh, BI level. Um, from a, a data flow perspective, we see um, companies um, using NoSQL, using Hadoop technologies to actually do the refining of raw data, do the pre-processing of a lot of data that comes in, then, for example, filter it, build models, um, find the interesting nuggets of that data, and move that into the data warehouse. So this is a pretty commonly seen way to use uh, polystructured data today is to having a separate system to actually be able to work with it, to make it more structured and then um, move it into the data warehouse. More structured and less volume. And then you can actually use it in the data But the other way around is also interesting for a lot of companies. For example, if you run a recommendation in your web shop based on the behavior of the person, it's pretty interesting to know what clicks he did, and then you start to offer him something. But it's also very interesting to know what he's bought by uh, from you in the last year. But this data is in the data warehouse. It's not in the click stream you're processing in the in the um, uh, polystructured part. So if you would be able to use that data also, it can make better recommendation, and that's what's done also. So it actually goes both ways, depending on the application and what you want to do. So what we can see, there's some um, key issues that are addressed by the data technology. It's definitely scalability, both on the data side and the user side. It's performance, it's especially the analytical databases that are highly performant for query, but also we look at performance for data integration, like the streaming databases that are able to process a lot of data very, very quickly. We look at flexibility, flexibility in data management and also flexibility for the user. Um, the concepts employed here, both in analytical databases and in uh, the polystructure, big data world, um, are often late binding. So we come to a concept where we are not modeling data in a very um, um, discrete way up front, but we often use the raw data, keep it as it is, and then uh, as a light binding, at the time we want to analyze it, we actually build the models around. And this creates a lot of flexibility, and this is a common concept we found here. And cost is a major concern today. We have open source concepts here. We use a file system that for polystructured data um, should be much more cost efficient than a big, big reaction database. So we, we look at these issues that are addressed. And there are some things I think that will challenge us all. 
to rethink some very well-known concept we work with for 20 years now. It's definitely the analysis. I think we will create more and more results that come with the probability. That will not, not, not be said. It's not we sold a hundred pieces yesterday. That comes out of our data warehouse for sure. But now if we work with this type of data, we look at more uh, probabilistic results sometimes. We will maybe look at data modeling at real runtime, as I said already. We might be starting to think about data integration on the fly. So if we don't have a model, maybe we, we actually if we create the model at the time of analysis, we actually want to maybe get to the data at that time only also. So concepts like data federation, virtualization, I think will be increasingly important. Data quality, if you have like hundreds of terabytes of raw data, it's pretty, um, it's actually not too interesting to identify the very single data point, whether that's right or wrong. We actually look at sets of data now, and if you have um, very individual points with bad data quality, they don't affect you anymore, because it's not financial data. So maybe there's some rethinking going on in that regard also. Architecture will be heterogeneous, I already showed that, and the single point of truth in the heterogeneous world will be pretty hard to get to. So we'll definitely need one, that's for sure, but it will be logical. It will probably not be physical. Or it will be increasingly difficult to get to a physical single point of truth. So, what's happening in the world? Structured data on the East Coast, unstructured, poorly structured data on the West Coast. Asia is moving very, very quickly. And what we see in data is really big there. There are lots of companies that have more customers than we have people as a population in these countries. So they really are really concerned with big data. And they are moving quickly into these technologies. They see them very, very quickly. So the question is, what do we do? What do we do here? What I think is we, we have the methods and technology now. We can become data-driven company. And I think it's time to move. Thank you very much.